You know, I'm pretty sure at one point or another you've heard somebody talk about reasons why they're dissatisfied with modern day mainstream fighting games. Whether it's the influx of things implemented for accessibility like modern controls, or perhaps the fact they don't like that most mainstream fighting games have 3D designs. There's a whole bunch of others, but those are usually the main two I hear about all the time. For me personally, the one instance where modern mainstream fighting games have let me down, you see the title. As a lover of horror and fighting games, I really just don't like the fact that we don't have any horror based fighting games in the mainstream anymore. If there is one big thing I miss about the 90s, it's that. Because of course, we had Darkstalkers and you know what's happened with Darkstalkers. And when Mortal Kombat is the closest thing we have to horror and fighting games in the mainstream, yeah. Not to mention, at least in my opinion, Mortal Kombat has abandoned most of the other elements of horror that it has outside of course the splatter elements with the fatalities of course. And I know that's like the biggest selling point and the signature trait of Mortal Kombat but I just miss the dark and eerie and dreadful overtones of horror that were more prominent in older Mortal Kombat games. That's why I feel like the series has kind of abandoned most of the horror outside of the splatter stuff. So yeah with that being said not a lot of horror in fighting games in the mainstream right now. So who of course is holding it down? Again, you see the title. The Indies, of course. This is why I've really loved learning about and delving into these indie fighting games. Because in most cases, they fill a lot of voids that are being left by the mainstream when it comes to fighting games. So as a little bit of a spooktober treat, and the fact that I'm kind of in a little bit of an overdrive seeing that I've been covering a lot of indie fighters recently, I wanted to take some time to talk about some spooky indie fighting games that I wanted to highlight. So let's get right into it. The super duper early, totally free Mugen version of The Black Heart was released back in 2009, which was the year I started college and being on campus was when I actually stumbled into this game. <laughs> this is why it's so nostalgic to me. It was so crazy because before I even stumbled into this game, I was having a talk with another friend on campus who loved fighting games just as much as me and we were just reminiscing about old school fighting games. And once Darkstalkers was brought up, similar to the intro of this video, we both were talking about the lack of horror or spooky fighting games in the mainstream at that time. I then remember running this whole conversation by another friend and they recommended that I actually look for some free stuff online. As they mentioned, a lot of people were making free games and putting their stuff out there for people to play. And that's how I stumbled into The Black Heart. And it was so cool seeing another fighting game around that time, going back to the old pixelated art style, having the same bloodthirstiness as Mortal Kombat, but even still having a tinge of that silliness and goofiness that Darkstalkers had. For some crazy reason, when I picked this game up, I mostly mained Paquito. I don't know why, because I actually thought all of the character designs were pretty cool, especially once I delved into everyone's move list and fighting style when I could stop playing Paquito. Yeah, I dug this roster of six characters. Given the lack of horror based fighting games around that time, it was actually pretty cool to even see characters that were based on certain types of urban legends and characters that hadn't been represented in a game like Darkstalkers for instance. I mean sure in general some of these characters are probably somewhat familiar, like Noroko is obviously going to make you think of Sadako and Kayako, there's a spider lady here. But then you have Animus who is trapped inside of an Iron Maiden for 400 years and when you look at this character fight it's by far the craziest thing in the game. And it's also enhanced by the voice work on him as well. But then when it came to this some of the most interesting characters were Hashi and the Shara Makai. 
With Hashi, it wasn't just cool seeing a spooky shrubbery based character, but then as I dug into and looked up stuff on the character, I found out that he was based on a creature in Argentinian folklore. And this was around the time I was really getting into reading about urban legends from around the world and seeing that one just so happened to pop up in a fighting game, my favorite genre of video game. <laughs> Couldn't be more perfect. The Sharmakai, from what I could tell, were not based on any urban legends that were known in the world. But what was interesting was the fact that this was a creature made by the creator of the Blackheart, Andres Borghi, back in 2001 at the age of 18 when he made his first film. I find it so awesome how he went from filmmaking, then got into Mugen as the trailer suggests, and then brought the character back and made a full on fighting game from it. Like. I don't know about anyone else, but that is phenomenal. That's a phenomenal backstory. Fast forward to 2021, after the game had got picked up by the publisher Cybot Studios, it came to Steam with a lot of upgrades. As shown in the trailer for its major release, Andres Borghi clearly heard the demand for more characters in this game, and thus more characters were added. One of which also came from his 2001 film Necropolis, that being Janos. And it didn't even stop there. It's cool to get more characters, but there was also more content. While sure you got all the blood and the stabbing and the chopping and all these different types of finishers, we got another layer of horror added to this game with story modes. Have full on scenes, expositions, all of that. And it definitely enhances a lot of the macabre and creepy imagery when it comes to these characters and stages. Like, little bit of a spoiler, not for the game, but for a future video that I plan to work on. There's been this whole talk with people asking, what's up with you guys worrying so much about story and fighting games? It's a fighting game, it's not like a visual novel or an adventure game. Why are y'all so obsessed with the story? Okay, let me give you an example of how story can enhance fighting games. Also, now that I think about it, there's going to be a slight story spoiler here, but nothing too major at least. So, Pequito pretty much my main in this game. In the beginning, in the early free Mugen version of this game, I always found his wind pose where he pulls out this severed head as pretty badass and also kind of spooky. The more I paid attention to the little details in this build of the game, I pretty much pieced together that he was some type of child killer ghoul type of character. I initially figured this was like one of his victims or something. Well, fast forward to the 2021 release of this game that has the story mode, and again, I'm not going to say too much, but that severed head that he's holding right there, it's actually his own when he was alive. Yeah, I leave the rest to you if you are interested. It is on sale right now on Steam for $5.99 until November 4th. Again, if you're like me and you love horror and you love fighting games, definitely check this out if you haven't already. Also, before I get to the next game, and I had just thought about it because it does kind of apply to the next game I'm going to cover, but... I noticed in some of the videos that I've mentioned with other indie fighting games that this is kind of a deal breaker for people, but yeah, there are motion controls in the Blackheart. So there you go, moving right along. So I apologize in advance, but best believe this game right here is due in for a full on straight up solo indie fighting game spotlight video. <laughs> I know I jabbed a little bit because I was getting a bit nostalgic when it came to the Black Heart and I didn't mean to go that long, but still, this game right here is due for a full on episode. Mostroscopy, or as it said in the title screen, <coughs> Monstroscopy, and I'm not kidding. 
that's how they say it like on the title screen. This game was actually released on Steam one year ago. It was brought to my attention by the very person that throws me a lot of recommendations all the time. Once again, let's give it up for Onyx Blade. Much love to you, bestie. Monstroscopy was developed and published by Oribeware Games. I hope I said that right. Sorry if I didn't. And when I do my usual digging and searching and investigating on these games when I'm recommended them, I found the Steam page and I instantly knew I was going to love this game once I saw the description. Not only is it taking up and actually has a really good aesthetic when it comes to horror, but Lucha films from the 1950s? Lucha? With me being a wrestling fan? Oh, bring it here, bring it here. And like I said, the game looks really good. I love the UI. I love just the whole aesthetic. But they... <laughs> The characters are monsters and mass luchadores and luchadoras. This seems like it was made for me just on the strength of just the theme. Now, I already hinted at this going from the previous entry to this one, but yes, this particular game has simple modern controls, which I know for some people that's a deal breaker and hey, that's your prerogative. For me, if you're going to have some simple controls or modern controls, whatever you want to call them, at least try to make the overall gameplay experience intriguing. I know that more than likely these two games aren't the first and the final ones to do this. They're just the ones that popped in my head. But Persona 4 Arena achieved this before Mostroscopy and Grand Blue Fantasy vs. Rising achieved it after Mostroscopy, which is funny because I think Grand Blue Fantasy vs. Rising came out only a couple of months after this game came out. In my opinion, it is possible. You just have to do it. And not even just when it comes to the gameplay, but at least with the experience of the game. And what I mean by that is something else that I feel like once again feels like this game is just tailor made for me because it has a story mode. And how is it presented? Visual novel format. <laughs> oh, this game. And the art style they really pick for the visual novel scenes really does pop. It's basically the same art style they use with the character portraits on the select screen. Also, one other thing I want to brag about when it comes to this game is what a soundtrack. You have songs ranging from cinematic horror tracks to even some tracks that sound like surf rock to me a little bit. And with the one stage of the one samurai character, Toshido Murayama, there's a nice samurai J-Rock song that honestly, if you ask me, sounds like it would also fit in a game like Samurai Showdown. So yeah, if you're liking the look of this game and you want something a little bit more casual, I definitely recommend Mostroscopy, which is also on sale right now. Moving right along. This final game, unlike the previous two, you can't buy this one. Who here remembers Umbral Core? Once again, courtesy of Onyx Blade, I was made aware of this and he even informed me around the time they had a playable demo out. And from the little bit that I played, even though I regret not recording any of it, I actually liked it. Granted, of course, this might teeter more into the dark fantasy category, but its overall dark and gothic design and overtones actually made me want to cheer for it. Because again, you don't see stuff like this much anymore when it comes to mainstream fighting games nowadays. After an announcement video, an EVO preview trailer, some videos going over the mechanics, a trailer going over the story and narrative of the game, and a project trailer, no one had really heard much of anything about Umbral Core. So of course, I went to the official Discord, which around the time wasn't really active aside from mostly the off-topic channel. Surprisingly, a couple of days ago, after someone had asked about the status of the game, one of the devs actually responded. Apologies for the lack of updates as of lately. These have been rough times, but we believe to have figured out a way to keep things moving. We will be making a post in the coming days about the status of the project. Like Frostfire Battle Frenzy that I mentioned in a previous video, Umbral Core also has a Patreon, and for $5 or more, you get access to the latest build of the game. I occasionally would get reminded of Umbral Core when I look at my Steam library because I do have the demo still there, however I can't access it, and I just always wondered what was up with the game. 
With this recent post from one of the developers, I do hope that Umbral Core will continue to move on. It has a great look, a pretty solid playstyle, and a narrative that does have some potential. Which I do recommend you check out the narrative trailer, the art and voice work on it are awesome. And once again, I really do hope that Umbral Core continues to progress and eventually comes out to a few rounds games, the developer and publisher, I'm rooting for you. And that basically does it for this edition of Indie Fighting Game Spotlight, the Spooktober Special. I hope you all take care, stay hydrated, and for those of you who are celebrating and even those who are not, be safe out there, please. See ya.